All right, let's get uh, underway. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, and chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. We got through verse 10 last week, and we spent the most, the most part of, the better part of two weeks considering Melchizedek as he was compared to Christ. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of information about Melchizedek or tell us exactly where he came from, how he appeared in the scriptures. We speculated last week somewhat, but <clears throat> let's read verses 11 <coughs> down through 17 today. Well, let's pick up Hebrews 7, <coughs> starting at verse 11. If therefore, uh, excuse me, yeah, I got it right. If therefore, for perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. There's really nothing difficult about this uh, section. All is very clear. After reading verses 1 through 10, which we did the last two weeks, it's plain that the Levitical priesthood was lacking something. It was not perfect. Look at verse 11 once again. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron? Uh, otherwise, the Lord would not have mentioned another priesthood to come, some other order of priesthood. <clears throat> 400 years after the Levites were instituted as the priests, the King David said, quote, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Whoever Melchizedek once was, he was now long gone by the time of David. But his reputation was certainly recorded and remembered. And God speaks of someone who would come just like Melchizedek, whose priesthood would last forever. Um, the Levite priests were the uh, exponents of God's law. They were charged with interpreting and teaching the laws of God to the people. I want you to go back to uh, a couple of places in the Old Testament. First of all, to Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 17, and let's begin there with verse 8, Deuteronomy 17, verse 8, if there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates. Then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence which they of that place, which the Lord shall choose, shall show thee. And thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee, according to the sentence of the law, which they shall teach thee, <clears throat> excuse me, and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand, nor to the left. And the man that will do presumptuously, and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall die. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. Also, the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 7. 
We spent about one full year on Wednesday night studying the book of Ezra in 2018. And it's not a large book, but a lot of great things to observe. And if you weren't here on Wednesday nights, you missed out. Well, and I pity you. You missed a lot of great stuff. Ezra chapter 7, and let's begin with verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. By the way, scribe means shrive in German, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe, of the words of the commandments of the Lord, and of his statutes to Israel. But um, with a change in the priesthood, something about the law is going to have to change as well. Notice back in our text, Hebrews 7, verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Obviously, Christ came from the tribe of Judah. He did not come from Levi, as verse 14 says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Christ's forerunner, John the Baptist, was from the tribe of Levi. His father, Zacharias, was a priest in the temple. We read in Luke 1, about verses 5 through 9, along there. And the truth is, King David was the first priest to come from the tribe of Judah. I want you to go back to the book of First Chronicles. <clears throat> First Chronicles and chapter 21. I'll give you a moment to turn there. First Chronicles 21. Because of pride and through his pride, David commands that the people of Israel be numbered. Uh, how many subjects do I have under me? Of course, it was something he should not have done. God's anger was against David for having done this. God sends an angel of the Lord to out, go out and start um, slaying people in Jerusalem with a pestilence. A pestilence is a very fast-moving, fast-spreading disease which claims a lot of lives in a short space of time. And uh, by the time it was all done, down there in verse 14, I think 70,000 people had been slain in Jerusalem. Because of David's sin, uh, God sent judgment to his people. I mean... Your actions, the Bible says, Romans uh, 14, verse 7, uh, no man, for no man liveth to himself, and no man, or for none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Your actions can affect the lives and the fortunes of other people when you're not expecting it to. You don't think it will, but it, it may. So you always have to be cautious about living right for God being as close to the Lord, as obedient as you can to the Lord. Otherwise, you might cause harm to other people. I'm intending to preach on that subject next Sunday on suffering and suffering in the world and the benefits that can come from suffering. But I think I mentioned this not long ago. People suffer for at least three reasons. Number one, they have a free will, and they've 
made bad decisions. Number two, the next guy has a free will too, and he's made bad decisions. They got in your way. And number three, your parents and grandparents before you made bad decisions. Many times that, that falls to you to live up, live up, up to their bad reputation or to try to live down their bad reputation. Um, sometimes your parents have done dumb things. Uh, parents who just you know, swear like sailors and smoke and drink in front of their children don't care what their kids hear, and they're not mindful of it, don't, shouldn't be surprised when their kids grow up to start cursing like sailors too. And nobody wants to hear some five, six, seven-year-old you know, throwing out four-letter words and the F-bomb and all this and that, and yet I've heard it, I've seen it, and uh, so you you suffer for any number of those three reasons. Some guy said, 90% of all of our human suffering is from other people not thinking as highly of us as we think they should. <laughs> That's one way of putting it, because the pride and the ego and the arrogance of man always looking for someone to, to make them feel good. But look at, um, so God's angry with David, the angel of God goes out to slay people by <coughs> pestilence, and in David's repentance of God, he buys a piece of land from Ornan the Jebusite, uh, there in First Chronicles 17, verses uh, 25, 26, and 27. Let's read those. For thou, O oh my God, hast told thy servant that thou wilt build him a house uh, before, the, um, before thy servant hath found in his heart to pray before thee. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm in chapter 17. My mistake. That's the one mistake I'm going to make today. <laughs> First Chronicles 21, verses 25 through 27. So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. So he stopped uh, slaying in Jerusalem. Therefore, Melchizedek and David were both kings and priests, as the Lord Jesus Christ is and will be. And the two things that are said to be evident, they're in our text, verses 14 15. Evident means something's plain and clear, it's obvious. And the word obvious literally means something's standing in the way. You can't miss it, you trip over it if you're not careful. <clears throat> and evident. Number one, the, the priest who would be like Melchizedek uh, had to be, according to verse 16, made not after the law of a carnal commandment, that pertains to the flesh, but after the power of an endless life. That's spiritual. And number two, as such, the priest like Melchizedek uh, couldn't come from Levi, according to verse 14. For he testified that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, there in verse 17, quoting from Psalm 110 and verse 4. And Christ came from the tribe of Judah, not from the tribe of Levi. So Melchizedek was a type uh, and David uh, of David as well as Christ, and David <clears throat> was a type of Christ as well as Melchizedek, both of them kings, both of them priests before God. However, David came from Judah, not from the tribe of Levi. And the one, and I mentioned this last Sunday, the Levites were descended from Abraham and the 12 tribes in time. The Levites were descended from Abraham, and it was to them God granted the priesthood to minister on behalf of all the rest of Israel. But Abraham, their ancestor, paid tithes to someone else in his day named Melchizedek. Therefore, in co co comparison, Melchizedek's priesthood was higher and greater in authority and worth and value than the Levites who would descend from Abraham many years later. 
And so the Levitical priesthood had its limitations. The priest had, priest had to not only uh, sacrifice for the people, but he made sacrifices for himself before he was then worthy to go and sacrifice for the people. You know, when the priest, the high priest, would go into the holiest place uh, and make atonement for the sins of the nation, he'd pour blood on the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And if his heart wasn't right, God would slay him in there. And you hear these uh, stories, and I don't, I don't know that I've ever read it in the scriptures, but they say that they would tie a line around the priest um, or a rope around the priest. And um, as long as the priest was in there moving about, uh, all was well and good. But if the, the line on the outside ceased to move, it was just laying on the ground, then it was a good indication God had slain the priest in there for some sin in his heart. And they'd use that line of that rope to pull him, to pull him out uh, of the holiest place. I don't know if that's true or not. It makes a nice story, but I don't think the Bible would give us any indication of that. Anyway, let's read the rest of this chapter, verses 18 through 28. And we undoubtedly will come back to it next week and make a few comments, but the rest of Hebrews chapter 7, starting with verse 18. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment, going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. That is, the commands of God to men, uh, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that, they all had to do with conduct and behavior and obedience. You would show your obedient, your, your uh, faithfulness to God by the degree of obedience to his revelation, his commandments. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And it was, of course, the death of Christ which made us uh, able, qualified us to draw close to God. Not being Levites, not being priests, uh, and for our sakes, not even being Jews. Verse 20, and inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, God made no promises to the Levites that their priesthood would last forever. However, Melchizedek, and as a type of Jesus Christ, his priesthood would last forever. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Yes, he was. That summarizes it very well. And they, and they, the Levites, truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So one man's a priest, he dies, his son uh, is born in the tribe of Levi. He, it was his job to then be a priest, and so on. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. You know, the Lord Jesus didn't stay dead. He came back to life again. Therefore, his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary is still able to cleanse a sinner from his sin 2,000 years later. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The uttermost. The farthest reaches you can go. As far as you can go around the world, every sinner there and the blood of Christ is able to cleanse them, to cleanse them of that sin, to wash that sin away by faith in his death for their sakes. My dad said, they used to say, God saved from the uttermost to the guttermost, the, lo the lowest sinner around. I was talking about dogs in our church hour. I thought of a couple of things I, I meant to say and I forgot to say while we were uh, in that sermon. And nobody wants to be called a dog unless you're the top dog, <laughs> right? You're the big dog. And as they say in the Iditarod up in Alaska, uh, unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> That's right. You have to think about that. But he's able to save to the uttermost uh, them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. 
Christ no longer has to die on the cross, but now he's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for the saints. And the sinner that will call upon God uh, and claim the blood of Christ as the Amen. only um, agent that can cleanse his soul. Verse 26, for such an high priest became us, he became, uh, he, he was made like unto sinners, he was made like man for the sake of man's sin, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, Christ, who is consecrated forevermore. All is fairly plain in that as well, that the Levites and their priesthood were limited. The, sac the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ is unlimited. <laughs> There's not a sinner whose sins are so great and so numerous that the Lord Jesus can't cleanse them, Praise wash God. away their sin, no matter who they are. Now, I'll grant you, some people sin more than others. I mean, the overt sin are things we obviously can identify. Some people clearly have sinned a lot more than others. But the, the degree of sin, or the amount of sin, is irrelevant. It's the fact of sin. Mm -hmm. The fact of sin. And um, I think I illustrated it once before. I didn't think about doing it today. I took a white piece of paper and I put one little mark on the, on the face of it. And I held it up and said, how many would, would use this to write a, a, a nice note or a love letter to somebody? No, because there's, there's something marring that, well, it's only one spot. I mean, the rest of it's still white and clean, but the presence of one mark makes it something you unsuitable, something you don't want to use to write an important note. I want you to look forward at Hebrews chapter 10 for a minute, just another page or so over. So the Levites had to repeat the sacrifices over and again. Every time someone sinned, they were obligated to bring an animal to the priests, to have that slain on their behalf as God had commanded, and this is how their sin would be forgiven. But it wasn't completely erased from their record. Hebrews 9.22 says, without shedding of blood is no remission. So like a cancer can be in remission, the cells are lying dormant for some reason, and uh, sometimes doctors aren't even sure why uh, it's gone into remission and doesn't seem to be progressing at that moment. But it's not completely erased and eliminated from the body. And so it was with sin, uh, it could be forgiven, but it wasn't cleared from your record. That's why a man could get as far as Abraham's bosom if he was obedient uh, up until death, but he couldn't get any farther. He needed that sin completely erased and cleansed from his record. Um, look at Hebrews chapter 10, and first of all, verse 10 by the which will, that's the will of Christ, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Look up at verse 12 again. And the old Catholic Bible, the Douay Reims version, verse 12 read, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, comma, forever sat down on the right hand of God. They move the comma back about seven or eight spaces. By simply doing that with the punctuation, they open the door for a Catholic priest to make repeated sacrifices every week with the Mass. By moving the comma from after the word forever to before, you see how people can corrupt the Bible with the most minor, small, minute little change? 
and it can make a major difference in interpretation. See, they believe that the priest takes the bread and the wine in their mass, and he says words of consecration over it. This is my body, hocus corpus meum, was the phrase in Latin. And he transforms that bread, or by the power of God, he transforms that bread into the human flesh of Jesus, and he transforms that wine into the human blood of Jesus. Not a symbol. The actual blood and flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Council of Trent, the 1500s, said, if any man shall uh, deny that uh, in the elements of bread and wine are contained the entire Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, let him be accursed. So they, they don't take it as a symbol. They don't take it simply as a, an image or a, a representation. They believe that that bread becomes the actual human flesh of Jesus, and that wine becomes his human blood. And this is how you get Jesus in you, by actually eating him and drinking his blood, literally. It's not a, it's not a, not a spiritual operation. It's an actual physical one. You have to drink his, flesh and, or drink his blood and eat his flesh. But, um, and so the priest does this repeatedly on the altar of their, their churches day after day after day after day, after day for, for, for weeks and months and years and centuries. They've been doing this, claiming that it's something that has to be done every day. If the Lord Jesus Christ's death wasn't all sufficient the first time, it will never be all sufficient no matter how many times you repeat it, right? This is the, the corrupt nature of the Roman Catholic doctrine. They are no more God's priests than um, Moon Sung Myung was one of God's priests, right? <laughs> or Catherine Kuhlman. Or Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts. What a snake in the grass. That guy was such a deceiver. I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> so he can't do any more damage to the cause of Christ. If he was saved, he's in heaven, but I'm glad he's dead. But to be a true, God has no priesthood class in the New Testament. All believers are equal to each other. Jew, Gentile, um, everyone is part of the body of Christ if they're trusting in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. Uh, God doesn't separate some people. You're higher up than everybody else. Uh, the pride of man wants to elevate himself and expect other people to follow and believe him. But that's not the way God set it up. He that is great among you, let him be your servant, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20. But So the, the priesthood of Christ after the order of Melchizedek was to last forever. And I mentioned, I think last week, it says Melchizedek has, has an... A continual, a, a continual priesthood where Christ is said to be forever. I think I made a distinction between the word continual and continuous, right? Continual means happening at short intervals with a little space in between. And I, I think I use the illustration of the telephone. If the phone rings every five minutes, uh, it's continual, happening over and over and over again. But if the ringer keeps ringing and then shut off, that's continuous. That's a subtle difference in the English words. But so the, the Melchizedek's priesthood says was to be continual, where the priesthood of Christ is forever. Much more like continuous. It never ends. That's why 2,000 years after Calvary, Christ's blood shed on the cross is still powerful enough by faith to cleanse a sinner of his sin and his guilt. Amen. 